Theistic Evolution Critique, God's Action in the World. We've been going through the book Theistic Evolution, a scientific, philosophical, and theological critique. We're into the philosophical area. And um, before we go, I'll point out that there are several different ways of trying to fit uh, science and particularly Christian religion, but Jewish religion as well, um, together. There's young life creationism, various stripes. Um, there's what's traditionally called old earth creationism, but should be probably called old life creationism. There is theistic evolutionism that is friendly to intelligent design. Everything happens slowly, um, but God not only acted in the world, but it's his action is detectable. There is non-intelligent design friendly theistic evolution, which says that uh, God acted in the world, but you can't really tell. For all you know, it could have been. Uh, it could have been uh, an atheistic process. And then there's finally atheistic evolution itself. Those are the most common ways of putting things together. And this book is not aiming at atheistic evolution, which is kind of traditional to aim at. This book is specifically aimed at non-ID theistic evolution. Um, and this uh, particular chapter is by C. John Collins. We ran into C. John Collins before in a quote, and I liked his quote, so I was looking forward to reading the chapter. Um, this, the chapter is in section two, the philosophical critique of theistic evolution, and it's how, how to think about God's action in the world. Basically, and you'll see the very beginning will have a, a quote by Rudolf Bultmann, so you can see what uh, area that he's aiming at. The summary is tradition, Christians have traditionally thought of God's works of providence as including what we call natural and supernatural, and both are equally God's action. They have also thought that at least some of the supernatural actions are in principle discernible as special by humans. This provides a robust tool for reading the Bible, for living wisely, and for doing science. A fully evolutionary perspective that seeks to, to be traditionally Christian affirms that God acts through the natural events of the evolutionary process and still allows for miracles outside this process, such as the death of the Egyptian firstborn. You will notice that this is someone who accepts that evolution accounts for a whole lot. However, whatever processes of descent with modification God might have used, its natural functioning is not enough to account for the origin of the world of life and of human reason. Nor does recognizing this involve us in a God of the gaps fallacy. In fact, for good critical thinking, we should be careful about both appealing to miracle to cover our ignorance and about excluding, before we even begin our study, the possibility of extra help from outside the natural process. And that's the end of the summary. And the chapter begins. My goal in this chapter is to explain how the traditional Christian way of talking about God's action in the world, which accounts well for the biblical materials, provides us with an intellectually robust way of thinking about how miracles in design relate to science. Introduction, the issues. One way to begin our discussion is to see how people want to either assert or to deny the credibility of what we call miracles in the Bible, thinking them to be incompatible with a modern scientific outlook. Classical denial comes from the German New Testament scholar Rudolf Bultmann, whom I'm sure most of you have heard of, it is impossible to use electric light and the wireless and to avail ourselves of modern medical and surgical discoveries, I'm sure he would say cell phones by now, uh, and at the same time to believe in the New Testament world of spirits and miracles. We may think we can manage it in our own lives, but to expect others to do so is to make the Christian faith unintelligible and unacceptable to the modern world. If you can do that privately, good for you, but you're never going to sell this stuff. 
Christians have sought various ways of countering this denial, whether by clarifying how the traditional understanding meets it, as will I, or else by reframing their description of how to think about God's action. One common way of reframing is to employ a notion of God's action in which miracles are not metaphysically different from natural events. The difference is rather in their noticeability to the human observer. Uh, this can go in one of two ways. Providentialism, in which every event is in principle the product of created natural forces that God providentially sustains. Uh, that is to say, there are no real miracles. If you just knew all the rules, you could predict this one too. And the other one is occasionalism, in which created things have no actual causal power, and every event is supernatural. Uh, it is not by inherent power that... Uh, Breath follows breath, and heartbeat follows heartbeat. Um, these two alternative views often share similar notions of what miracles are, namely events that are subjectively important without being metaphysically different from any other event. A challenge to sorting these matters out comes from the fact that the Bible writers rarely, if ever, give what we call a technical or metaphysical discussion of the mechanics of the events they record. Imagine what would happen if they did. For example, an ordinary pregnancy is God's action. See Psalms 139, 13 through 15, Jeremiah 1, 5, you know, uh, as is Elizabeth's pregnancy with John and Mary's with Jesus. Elizabeth was past menopause. You can't do that. Oh, yes, you can. And Mary's with Jesus, not even having a man to impregnate her. In the sections that follow, I will lay out this tra the traditional way of describing God's actions which suits the biblical presentations better than the alternatives. I will also show why using this traditional understanding together with literary sensitivity can help us steer clear of the kinds of difficulties that Boltman found. Finally, I will mention briefly how this discussion also helps us think about the controversial notion of design as we find it, or think we do, in the world of nature. Traditional notion, uh, notions of natural and supernatural. We ought first to define what we are speaking of, what is ordinary or natural, and what is miracle. Straight away, we face difficulties, since there is no technical biblical discussion of either of these notions. That, of course, is hardly evidence that the concepts themselves are foreign to the Bible. Rather than rely on etymologies, miracle comes from uh, uh, the, the verb to see, or on various definitions of miracle that have been offered, often for polemical purposes and often very representing varied, varied metaphysics, I shall content myself with stating the standard scholastic metaphysic of ordinary and miraculous events and citing a few biblical texts that clearly support this position. The Lutheran theologian Heinrich Schmidt gives a representative, re representative description of divine providence as having three elements, preservation, concurrence, and governance. Preservation is the act of divine providence whereby God sustains all things created by him so that they continue in being with the properties implanted in their nature and the powers received in creation. Created things have no power of subsistence in themselves. By the way, there, those are his ellipses. Um, therefore, preservation is also designated as continued creation. I'm not sure I see a difference between that and occasionalism, actually. Um, concurrence, concurrence or the cooperation of God is the act of divine providence, whereby God, by a general and immediate influence proportioned to the need and capacity of every creature, graciously takes part with second causes in their actions and effects. That sounds like what you kind of call providence in one sense. Uh, um, God taking special note of things, and altering without people being able to see it clearly. Government is the act of divine providence in which God most excellently orders, regulates, and directs the affairs and actions of creatures according to his own wisdom, justice, and goodness for the glory of his name and the welfare of man. Um, that's kind of vague, I think, but... The providence of God ordinarily employs second causes and thus accomplishes its designs. 
But God is by no means restricted to the use of those second causes, for he often exercises his providence without regard to them and operates thus contrary to what we call the course of nature, and hence arises the difference between ordinary and extraordinary providence. That's continuing a quote, I think. Yes. Um, there is no doubt here that both ordinary and extraordinary miraculous providence are expressions of God's active power. It is never correct to refer to the miraculous as having God more directly or immediately involved. However, the mode of that expression of power is different, at least in principle. Some of those differences are discernible by human observers. God's activity in maintaining the creation is not physically detectable, since it is not part of the order of the world we experience with our senses. God is doing everything, but you can't really look at nature and be sure that it's God. Um, except maybe at the beginning. Some sample texts show that this is a good inference from the biblical material. For example, James 3 supports the idea of natural powers by which a fig tree cannot yield olives. Hebrews 1.3 speaks of all things depending on Christ's active power of upholding. Um, and there's more texts like that. And Exodus 14.21 shows an extraordinary miraculous event that uses a means, the east wind. And Luke 1, 34 to 35 describes a mechanism of a supernatural event, the conception of Jesus, as being due to the special agency of the Holy Spirit. Doesn't say exactly how that works. Let's use this approach to God's providence to analyze an example, the deliverance of Jerusalem from the forces of Sennacherib. 1 Kings 19, there's, there's actually three different passages in the Bible that refer to that. Tell the story, not just refer to it. And I forgot to make that 17 a, a superscript. The biblical texts say that an angel of the Lord slew a large number of Assyrian soldiers which caused the surviving army to flee. Herodotus reports an incident in which during the night an army of field mice swarmed through the Assyrian camp and chewed up their quivers, bowstrings, and even the handles of their shields. As a result, the army woke up and defenseless, fled, and many fell. Let's suppose, for the sake of this discussion alone, that these two accounts deal with the same events. Maybe they do, maybe they don't. But let's suppose they do. Are they competing alternatives? Certainly not. A supernatural event can use means, the mice, and if the mice were a natural occurrence, it is still, to the eye of faith, God's act. Indeed, it remains possible that Herodotus is telling missed out on the possible func function of the mice's symbolic of pestilence, in which case the event had more complexity than Herodotus told. In other words, maybe Herodotus didn't have it completely correct. With this traditional metaphysic, we can speak of the natural properties of created things and their interactions in place of the more common laws of nature. This leads to the following definitions. Natural, God made the universe from nothing and endowed the things that exist with natural properties. He preserves these properties and he also confirms their interactions in a web of cause and effect relationships. Supernatural. God is also free to infuse special operations of his power into this web at any time. For example, by adding objects, directly causing events, enabling an agent to do what its own natural properties would never have made it capable of, and by imposing organization according to his purposes. Some object to the very idea of distinguishing natural and supernatural in the Bible. The Old Testament scholar John Walton insists people in the ancient world had no category for what we call natural laws. Um, we'll see that that's probably not actually true. When they thought in terms of cause and effect, even though they could make all the observations that we could make, they were more inclined to see the world's operation in terms of divine cause. This, however, is a mistaken reading of the rhetoric, uh, uh, italics or uh, Collins, um, of passages like Psalm 104. A text like that does not give the ordinary view, rather it cultivates the perspective of faith, which includes natural causality as we saw, which corrects the default view. John Rogerson had a better sense of the rhetoric when he observed these passages, the ones that per express pervasive divine activity, do not represent what the average is Israelite felt. They are religious texts containing a religious interpretation of the natural world. 
a religious interpretation that was certainly not given along with ordinary perception of the world and with, with which and which was by no means self-evident to anyone who reflected on the processes of the natural world. In other words, nature can be explained without getting Yahweh into the um, into the mix. The attempt of the Old Testament writers to claim the sovereignty of God over nature and its workings was not something easily attained with the help of thought processes or an outlook that really saw the divine and er readily saw the divine in everything. It was rather a courageous act of faith, persisted in when there was often much in personal experience and competing religions and outlooks that suggested such a convention was false. See also Joseph's profession of faith in Genesis 45, 7 through 8 and 50, 20. Just in case you don't remember, here's 7 and 8, uh, 45, 7 and 8, and God sent me, well, I'll let you look at it. So you can see Joseph is seeing uh, God's hand in what was apparently all natural events. And again, this is 50, 20. What role do miracles play in biblical faith? It is inherent in the traditional Christian metaphysic that miracles, or better, supernatural events, are possible. Under what conditions they may be expected is another question. Christian theologians commonly add provisions about miracles not being capricious, but related to God's pursuit of relationships with human beings. This puts us in a position to evaluate Boltman's objection to see that it is the combination of both a faulty reading of the biblical materials and the imposition of a worldview world preference naturalism, the universe as a closed system, which is not itself inherent in the scientific outlook. Of course, within the biblical worldview, we can use the electrolyte, electric lights and the wireless, not to mention modern medicine. These are all technologies that exploit the natural properties of the things God made. They are part of our exercising dominion. And the spirits and miracles in the Bible do not come willy-nilly or capriciously, nor do they undermine the functioning of the natural properties. Some people mistakenly suppose that because we have so many occasions of miracles, therefore the Bible leads us to expect them all the time. But as a matter of fact, the speech act theory idea of tellability helps us here. The authors select what events to record precisely because they are worth telling about probably because they rarely occur. These provisors are quite appropriate. At the same time, Christian theism resists the notion that supernatural events are in some way unworthy of God. It is quite true that a doctrine of creation posits a created world that has all its necessary capacities built into it, needing no tinkering, but those capacities are the ones necessary for the world's assigned purpose, namely of being the background for the lives and choices of rational agents with whom God intends to interact. That's a rather deep uh, paragraph and it's worth thinking about. While these special events often address crises of human need, they play two roles. First, they authenticate divinely approved messengers, prophets and apostles, and they give some examples there. And secondly, they make God's interest in the corporate well-being of his people, Israel and the church, especially clear. For example, Exodus 14, 30 to 31. And next slide, I'll give you that text. An additional role is that of testifying about God's interest to those outside his own people with a view towards leading them to faith. Woo, wait. Uh, well, we'll give you that text too. Okay, here's the first passage that I mentioned. And... Uh, you can see that uh, its effect was to have the people of Israel believe the Lord and his servant Moses. And then this is uh, in the song, and you will notice that the dukes of Edom shall be amazed, the inhabitants of Palestina, the mighty men of Moab, uh, the inhabitants of Canaan, fear and dread shall fall upon them. By the greatness of thy arm they shall be as still as stone till thy people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over whom thou hast purchased. So. I don't know it's leading the Gentiles to faith in the traditional sense anyway, but it's certainly leading them to respect. Miracle science and God of the gaps. To claim to have discerned a miracle renders one liable to the charge of committing the God of the gaps fallacy. 
That is to say, supposing we come upon some object or event for which we do not have a naturalistic explanation and say, see, God must have done that, and then proceed to base either our own belief or our apologetic for belief on such an instance. This involves us in a risk. Supposing the sciences eventually provide a natural process-based explanation, then where does that leave God's involvement in the matter? And what were once grounds for believing God thereby made an argument for disbelief? A serious theological problem is also involved, at least within traditional theism, if, if we think that it is possible to say of some events or objects God made this, and of the natural ones God did not make this. The doctrine of providence cited above affirms that the products of second causes are every bit as much direct divine action as the miraculous events. Sounds to me like occasionalism. What then does it mean to declare that a supernatural event has taken place? How is it discernible and to whom? Normally we consider an event special when it is more than simply unusual. After all, lots of things are unusual. Rather, we have some notion that the, vo the result was both contingent, that is, it could have happened otherwise, and against our expectations, and that it served some important need. Sometimes that notion of ours is intuitive, in which case we do not assess our expectations of the outcome too strictly for their reasonableness. In other cases, we may apply more rigorous assessment of our expectations, I would put it a more rigorous assessment, and if they were reasonable, we feel a kind of wonder. In a few cases, we go even further. We conclude that the results should have been otherwise, and we base this on our knowledge of the factors involved. For us to declare an event supernatural, it must meet, the, meet this most stringent requirement. But this leads to our difficulty. Are we not simply appealing to gaps in our understanding of the natural course of things? Further, if our sense of its specialness depended on the event being miraculous, then a scientific or natural explanation diminishes the specialness. It will help us to recall two domains of scientific explanation, the nomothetic and the historical. In nomothetic explanations, we consider what normally happens and explain its causation. The thing fell because gravity pulled it down, whatever gravity is. We are looking for regularities or laws, hence the name, nomothetic. This domain predominates in most common definitions of science. In historical explanations, we are asking what specific chains of cause and effect produce the item we are studying. Obviously, the two are related, but they are also distinguishable. For example, how animals interact in an ecosystem is nomothetic versus why a particular species went extinct, which is historical. Of course, our historical explanations make use of our nomothetic ones. Now, the biblical theist ought not to appeal to special divine action in a nomothetic context, because in these situations, the ordinary function of God's creation, we recognize that God's activity is that of maintaining the order of what he had made. In a context like that, to invoke supernatural causation would involve the God of the gaps fallacy. Further, many historical events, such as the 1980 Mount St. Helens eruption, may actually, why do you, why do you pick that one? I don't know. Uh, may act, in fact be explicable by appeal to natural factors. In other words, it may be nomothetic in an important sense. To attribute these to supernatural action would also be improper, at least without plenty of further research. On the other hand, there can be unique events that do involve special divine activity, for example, creation, exodus, virgin birth, resurrection of Jesus. In such cases, it would be incorrect and misleading to insist that only natural factors are valid for describing what happened in those events. It would also be empirically inadequate. That is, there are gaps, and then there are gaps. First, there are gaps due to ignorance, and uh, I won't bother to read the Latin, which are simply gaps in our knowledge which may eventually be filled. But there are also gaps due to the nature, and again, there's Latin, of the things involved. The result goes beyond what these natural properties would have brought about, presumably without further uh, information or, or, uh, or power. The, we should exercise caution in declaring that we have discovered a, a lacuna naturae causae, that is, one that 
by nature. Since we do not know everything there is to know about the relevant natural properties. For example, we might speak of a medical miracle when someone recovers from cancer, and maybe in the discussion I'll try to bring one of those out, when all we really have a right to say is that we do not understand the process. Again, however, it is still God's work of healing, whether he does it naturally or by a miracle. On the other hand, we know enough about some things that we can have confidence when speaking of them. As C.S. Lewis pointed out, no doubt a modern gynecologist knows several things about birth and begetting, which St. Joseph did not know. But those things do not concern the main point. They say virgin birth is contrary to the course of nature. And St. Joseph obviously knew that, which is why he was initially inclined to put away his uh, espoused wife. What about design? To say that God created, maintains, and governs the world is to claim that his purposes are at work. And this raises the question of what has been called design and the discernibility of design. This further impinges on our notions of God's action in his world. The notion of design in the world of nature has had varied emphasis, which we must keep distinct. It goes beyond this essay to rehearse all history of notions of design, worthy as that effort would be. I will focus on a few points that come into play in contemporary discussions. Generally speaking, when people have seen design in the world, they interpreted it as a signpost to the deity who has fashioned the world as such a suitable place for humankind. And then he gives the argument from design by St. Thomas Aquinas in Summa Theologica. The fifth way, this is the fifth way of proving God's existence, is taken from the governance of the world. We see that things which lack intelligence, such as natural bodies, act for an end, and this is evident from their acting always or nearly always in the same way, so as to produce the best result, obtain the best result. Hence it is plain that not fortuitously, but designedly, and there's the Latin behind that phrase, do they achieve their ends? Now whatever lacks intelligence cannot move toward an end unless it be directed by some being endowed with knowledge and intelligence as the arrow is shot to its mark by the archer. Now, as the arrow is going somewhere, it's obvious it is planned. It's obviously that the arrow did not plan it. Um, therefore, some intelligent being exists by, which, by whom all natural things are directed to their end and this being we call God. Uh, Francis Beckworth, I'm going to omit his paragraph. William Paley paid more attention to instances of contrivance that make up the larger system, that is, places where he inferred that design had been imposed on smaller systems, uh, the watch, etc. The title of Paley's book, Natural Theology, or the Evidence and Attributes of the Deity Collected from the Appearances of Nature, makes clear his theological and apologetic purpose. Many say that Darwin's theory, the origin of species, um, oh, I guess the, that's a superscript one. I don't know why it jammed it there. Um, and superscript six, 1872. No, I'm not sure how that originally was, and it, it, it got uh, mutilated in, in the copy and paste. Undermine the Paleyesque argument from design. According to that reading, Paley had put forward many instances in the biological world that were impossible to account for except by divine imposition of design. Then, however, Darwin's theory of natural selection provided a natural process-based explanation of the features and interactions of organisms. The most that design could claim by this understanding was that God had designed the properties and the laws governing the process along the lines of the system design discussed above, as Darwin himself allowed. There could be a God, but if so, he's kind of you know, background material. Darwinism or which means Dar uh, Darwin could have been a theistic evolutionist in the for uh, uh, ID unfriendly way. Um, Darwinism, or more properly today, neo-Darwinism, has been given a naturalistic and anti-theistic spin among many science popularizers. In this context it, context, it is no surprise that critiques of Darwinism would arise. And many, but certainly not all, of these critiques were made in support of theism. The leading critiques are associated with intelligent design, which holds that certain features of the universe 
and of living things are best explained by an intelligent cause, not an undirected process such as natural selection. The controversial claim is that we can find instances of design in the world of nature, not only at the larger scale, but also uh, at the smaller, and that we have good grounds for calling these instances design. Examples from the larger scale include the fine-tuning of the universe, while from the smaller scale we have the origin of life and the origin of the human mind. Although many intelligent design proponents are theists of some sort, and many of those will use their findings for apologetic purposes, that use is not inherent in the project, hence to say, as some critics do, that intelligent design is simply Paley's project brought up to date, is highly mistaken. I'm not sure that's true. I think Paley may have been an intelligent design person too, uh, uh, just more enthusiastic than some. Because I must limit the scope of this essay, I will address two main criticisms directed against the idea of intelligent design. I've chosen some leading and representative critics of intelligent design within or the Orthodox Christian world, Francis Beckwith, Alistair McGrath, and Simon Conway Morris. These authors share the view that we may see the evolutionary process as the outworking of the characteristics that God built into the world. The first instance... The first criticism that I shall address is that intelligent design falls into the God of the gaps fallacy. Since, the critique goes, we cannot think of a natural process that could produce this structure or subsystem, therefore we include God must, conclude God must have made it directly. Oftentimes this criticism is coupled with the expectation that all gaps are simply gaps in our knowledge. Some have even suggested that it insults the creator if we think there is any other kind of gap than this one. In other words, you just wait, the gap will disappear on you, and your theory will have proven false. A second theological criticism is related. It is the interpretation of intelligent design that declares that God designed some things while he did not design others. Francis Beckwith states this objection clearly. The ID advocate tries to detect instances of design in nature by eliminating chance and necessity, or scientific law. This implies that one has no warrant to say that the latter two are the result of an intelligence that brought into being a whole universe whose parts, including its laws and those events that are apparently random, seem to work in concert to achieve a variety of ends. Let us grant for the sake of argument that there are indeed people who make these fallacious arguments who confuse the acknowledgement we don't know how this happened with there is no way this could have happened on its own, or who think this is designed, therefore means that is not designed. The two errors that Francis Beckworth is, is aiming at. The real question is not whether some people do this. The, question, the issue is whether such follies are inherent in the position. The Latin phrase to invoke is abusus usum non tollet, or... Abuse does not take away proper use. To use a biological analogy, to find a problem with one species does not prove that the entire genus, or even family, has the same problem. And I will argue that the genus manifestly does not most of the time. Um, first, in asking whether we can identify what we can call small-scale design, one is not logically denying the large-scale system design. It would be entirely reasonable to propose that God would make, could make a world that he designed to produce all manner of creatures by way of evolution. Those, these would still be his creatures, the product of his action. Indeed, indeed, I quite agree that the passages in Genesis about the kinds do not speak to the issue of evolution one way or the other. If the kinds arise through some kind of evolutionary process with or without extra help from God, notice the ID-friendly or not ID-friendly sort of, that is still God's process. At the same time, there may be places in which the design process does not itself have the capacity to produce the desired result. Say at the origin of life, which involves instituting an information processing system, and at the origin of the human mind, which participates in transcendence. These are not likely to be uh, caused by ignorance, since there is a principle that shows why the natures of the things involved are not enough. This means that the argument for finding uh, uh, gaps in nature causing in these places are worthy of discussion. If they are mistaken, the mistake is not self-evident, and the arguments deserve more than the brush-off they often receive. 
Further, this openness to finding uh, lacunae natural, naturae causa uh, within the overall process is no insult to the Creator's omnipotence. As C.S. Lewis observed, omnipotence means power to do all that is intrinsically possible, not to do the intrinsically impossible. Meaningless combinations of words do not suddenly acquire meaning simply because we prefix to them the two other words, God can. It remains true that all things that are possible with God, the intrinsic possibilities, are not things, but non-entities. Let us turn it around. Intelligent design is not the same as Aquinas' argument from design, nor is, is it the same as Paley's overreaching apologetic. It might or might not be science, depending on how we define that term. But surely the better question is whether it is a true account of the world we encounter. In the three points that G.K. Chesterton pointed to, it certainly seems to be, no philosopher denies that a mystery still attaches to the two great transitions, the origin of the universe itself and the origin of the principle of life itself. I would argue that the Cambrian explosion is another one of those, and there's probably more that just aren't recognized commonly. Most philosophers have the enlightenment to add that a third mystery attaches to the origin of man himself. In other words, a third bridge was built across a third abyss of the unthinkable when there came into the world what we call reason and what we call will. Those who insist before all investigation that all gaps are caused by ignorance are themselves committing a theological fallacy, as Paul Helm noted. It is not appropriate to argue a priori what God will and will not do with and in the physical creation, but, as with any contingent matter of fact, it is necessary to investigate what God has done. Perhaps, though, one may acknowledge the possibility of uh, gaps in nature, but nevertheless expect that they are invisible to the human observer. There is certainly a strand of Christian thought that denies that the creation offers much testimony to its creator. But that strand is not the mainstream, nor does it speak for the critics of intelligent design that I've interacted with here, as they happily use scientific arguments for their natural theology. And by the way, many of them argue that God created the universe, and that is reasonably provable. In other words, they're intelligent design advocates there. Nevertheless, there is a pastoral region, reason for an interest in such design that leaves the apologetic issue aside. Recall the various ways in which we infer that some event is special. The stronger the confidence we legitimately have that the outcome should have been different, the more clearly we are entitled to ponder what purpose may be behind the event, even when we do not know whose purpose or what purpose it might be. This matters to daily living because we live our lives against a backdrop of seeming arbitrariness or even meaninglessness as controlling the things that befall us, as Helm noted. Often there's a sharp dis disjunction between the view that God is in control and the seeming chaos and meaninglessness of human lives and the human affairs in general. Is this not chaos a disproof of the Christian claim that God rules the universe providentially? It would be a disproof if the idea of divine providence were an empirical hypothesis, if it were built only out of a person's direct experience and based wholly on it. Rather, for Christians, reliance upon the providence of God and an understanding of the character of that providence is based upon what God has revealed in Scripture and is confirmed in their own and others' experience. There is nothing wrong with wanting confirmation to reassure us that the purpose we profess is real and is not simply our fanciful projection. For example, a curious combination of coincidences in human misunderstandings led a young woman from Seattle to come to MIT where she joined a Bible study that was just right for her, led by the young graduate student whom she eventually married, me. I would not call that a miracle, though I am grateful and count it God's generosity. I am content to account for it in terms of orchestration with God's foreknowledge, foreknowing contingencies, choices, and even mistakes. But once during my teenage years, I was looking for snakes with a fellow herpetologist and foolishly sat as the spotter on the passenger side hood of a car moving along a gravel road. I signaled the driver that I saw a snake. He braked. And I went sliding forward off of the hood and right into the path of the oncoming front tire. My ordinary inclination would have been to roll counterclockwise. 
Um, and for reasons I still do not grasp, I rolled co clockwise instead into the ditch on the right. The wheel stopped a little past my head. I should have been killed, or at least paralyzed. Was it an interference, a rescue by a guardian angel, something more than an orchestration? I cannot say, though I have my suspicions, but it is surprising nonetheless and moving. A skeptic can always dismiss these as luck. The epistemic situation is analogous to that of answered prayer. The key point in all cases, though, is that the unexpected outcomes impel us to question whether an overarching purpose was at work. As Gandalf said to Frodo about Bilbo's lucky discovery of the ring, behind that there was something else at work, beyond any design of the ring maker. I can put it no plainer than by saying that Bilbo was meant to find the ring and not by its maker, in which case, case you were also meant to have it, and that may be an encouraging thought. And of course, in this particular case, uh, Bilbo was meant to find the ring by J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote the thing. I conclude then that those who insist that all events are in principle natural have taken a position that is inadequate in all the relevant dimensions, theological, empirical, and pastoral. By contrast, the traditional Christian metaphysic gives us a sound way of thinking about God's activity in every event. That is, we have no right to declare a priori that we may expect to find created natural factors alone to be adequate for everything. Christians certainly have the theological resources to be happy should we find a posteriori that they are sufficient for most things. The problem becomes acute when we consider that our discernment of large-scale design can yield a weaker confirmation than what we hope for. Finding design in the universe's properties, commonly called fine-tuning, is helpful though it is hard to know just how contingent the physical properties of the universe are. To appeal to the design of orchestrated events in the world's history is very indecisive. As C.S. Lewis observed, we know far too little to know to offer anything remotely resembling a reliable reading of these events. Mind you, these arguments may be weaker than we would like, but they are not pastorally use useless if we are already theists. For example, my children, who are Christians, can properly take the stories of my narrow escape from death and how their mother came to MIT as pointers to God's purposeful provision for their own lives. God's actions, worldview, in the public square. I mentioned above that it is controversial whether the notion of design belongs to the sciences or to some other discipline. That is an important question, but it matters more whether such notions can be seen as a true account of the world. Theists debate the degree to which instances of design should factor in to their apologetic arguments to those outside the faith. But I want to narrow in on the matter of how we function in our larger culture, working daily with people who do not share our beliefs. Should we insist that they acknowledge design anyhow? Might we at least ask them not to describe the sciences in such a way that these considerations are ruled out of court at the very onset? For example, two leading affiliations for science teachers in the United States, the National Science Teachers Association and the National Association of Biology Teachers have issued statements on teaching biological evolution. The NSTA statement um, says, evolution in the broadest sense leads to an understanding that the natural world has a history and that cumulative change throughout time has occurred and continues to occur. Biological evolution refers, uh, refers to the scientific theory that living things share ancestors from which they have diverged. It is sometimes called descent with modification. Notice this is evolution part two, not part three. Um, biological evolution also encompasses a range of mechanisms that cause, this is evolution part three, that uh, cause populations to change and diverge over time and include natural selection, selection migration, and genetic drift. There is no longer a debate among scientists about whether evolution has and is occurring. There is debate, however, about how evolution has taken place. Now that's, in his opinion, the good way. In principle, this leaves open the question of whether the changes come, where the changes come from, and thus represents a healthy, open-minded approach to science. On the other hand, the NADBT statement 
is more decidedly naturalistic. Evolutionary biology rests on the same scientific methodologies the rest of science uses, appealing only to natural events and processes to describe and explain phenomena in the natural world. That's flat out philosophical naturalism. In effect, they're saying that in order for you to be scientific and rational, you must agree beforehand that all explanatory gaps are caused by ignorance only. It is unwise to construct a priori and unrealistic requirements for what constitutes rationality. It makes more sense to identify uh, actions and judgments that we know to be rational and to discern from them what characteristics they have. We know that the judgment that Stonehenge is an instance of small-scale imposed design is rational. And any philosophy that would call the rationality of this judgment into question is itself undermined by the clash between the philosophy and our intuitive recognition. We have experience of rocks, wind, and water and the kinds of arrangements they produce. We recognize in Stonehenge, however, something that is beyond these natural capacities. We see that a pattern has been imposed on the components. Of course, William Clark's signature on the, or consider William Clark's signature on the stone formations called Pompey's Pillar in Montana. We have no problem being confident that either Clark himself wrote it or someone forged it. It simply cannot be a product of the stone because the linguistic message is not a product of the properties of its medium. The key to identifying uh, uh, gaps in natural causes then is to identify the principle that separates the design from the natural properties. This approach to detecting small-scale imposed design is, to be sure, an intuitive one, and perhaps some people will find this to be a shortcoming. We, all, we may also feel cautious about using it since we do not know everything there is to know about the relevant natural properties. On the other hand, we know enough about some things that we can have confidence when speaking of them. Further, to notice this kind of imposed design is not the same as knowing how or when, or by whom, I might add, the, the design was infused. The claims that all appeal to special divine action leads to God of the gaps fallacy amounts to a claim that all gaps are gaps due to ignorance. Namely, that behind every gap lies a completely natural explanation. Now, on the face of it, this is not an empirical claim. Instead, it sets limits on what kind of explanations are allowed for what we meet empirically. Suppose, though, that we want to make that approach the rule in science. The only way this could be rational is if we knew beforehand that there are no such gaps, but that is beyond the bounds of the natural sciences. No scientist who disavows small-scale design should be required to say that these gaps have a supernatural cause. But it is only honest to acknowledge the gap's existence, say, with a form of words, this object or event looks like it has an agent as its cause. I do not know of a non-purposive process that could have produced this effect. I do not wish to attribute the effect to an agent. For better or for worse, the scientists do occupy a de facto authoritative role in our culture's public discourse, at least to the point of influencing what people will count as plausible. This is because the scientists offer a story of where we came from and how we got to where we are. They also make promises about how we can proceed from here. The new atheists recognize this and have hijacked the sciences to support a naturalistic story of origins. The biological providentialists recognize this as well and put a teleological cast on natural evolution. Stephen Barr, a biological providentialist, acknowledges we would all be better off if more scientists simply admitted that there are things we don't understand about the hows and whys of evolution. Now, I'm not interested in laying the blame solely at the feet of those, these scientists. All I really ask for is a suitable approach to the sciences, such as the NTSA statement of offers, informed by good critical thinking. That is, a geneticist is an expert in the genome and a paleontologist in the fossil record. Then, when they want to integrate their findings into the larger story of what it means to be human, their reasoning is open to review by all kinds of people. Their expertise does not mean that their integrations automatically trump every critique. Under such an arrangement, I am sure that both the sciences and Christian faith will thrive. And that's the end of the chapter. Collins appears to argue for a supernaturalist long-age interpretation of science, or perhaps better, truth. He appears to accept a long-age interpretation for life on Earth and probably even a mostly evolutionary explanation 
probably more than even Steve Meyer would accept because Steve Meyer would say the Cambrian explosion is another area where you really have a gap. Um, he points out that the Bible accepts miracles as normal and notes that they fit with a mostly scientific world quite well, and I would agree with him on that. I agree with him also that the God of the gaps arguments are overrated and that they, and if applied consistently and uh, absolutely, they would vitiate biblical authority. I also agree that they are only valid if one assumes naturalism. So basically, God of the Gaps is a call to give up for theists. It is one point where I think we must philosophically push back. And I think that the pushback must extend deeper than what uh, John Collins recognizes. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Okay, um, can we pass the mic over? And, yeah. There we go. Is, that was a, a rather lengthy evaluation of what, at least to me, seemed pretty obvious. Uh, to insist that there are gaps that only God could bridge of kind of leaves the rest of the world not needing his involvement. And I've always had a problem with that, that if you look at everything that we see naturally as God designed, God directed, God implemented, using natural law that he established, then the gaps, they're real. And we approach them because we're following the creator's handiwork rather than saying, oh, the creator must have done this, but we don't need him for all the other stuff. Yes, and, and of course that's a, uh, I mean, he, he notes that that's not really a good theological position, uh, nor is it a good practical position. Uh, on the other hand, I think that uh, uh, there is at least a major strain of Christian theology that recognizes that God acts in some ways that that we can understand and count on, in other ways which kind of surprise us. Of course, that's the, that's the de definition of a miracle, isn't it? Right. Right. So we should not advance new understanding because we begin to eliminate the miracles. <clears throat> and tell you that that approach does not work with young Christians thinking this through. Uh, bring in God when you have no other explanation. Well, you know, I think that that's really um, as much an apologetic um, approach as it is a... Uh, as it is a theoretical, uh, dispassionate approach, because because I think that it does help to say that natural processes left to their own devices will not get you here. Um, and it it does help if if you have a canvas. That's designed. Okay, it's a background. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you can have a painting that's on that canvas that is designed in a further way, if I can put it that way. Um, I remember seeing a picture of a tree that had been carefully formed into the likeness of a chair. Um, a one trunk chair, but you know, there have been four branches that came out and came up, you know, and you could sit on the thing if, if you're not too heavy. Um, 
And you can recognize the tree as being designed and then the shape of the tree as a further design. And so you can have design upon design. Both of them are designed. But if you see the tree, you have no knowledge for sure that it didn't simply follow the pattern that it started out with. Whereas when you see the chair, you realize that there is an extra layer of design. In fact, I did an illustration once where we lined up black and white circles to represent uh, heads and tails uh, of a set of coins. And some somebody has observed that, yes, the black and white circles all arranged in rows is actually design. It is. But sometimes the... You know, heads and tails were arranged in a pattern that was dictated by things that are apparently random and probably really random, uh, or at least mostly random, certainly. And sometimes they happen to correspond very precisely to other <laughs> patterns. And when that happens, which ones are heads and which ones are tails are also designed very clearly. And there really isn't any way of getting around that. That does not happen naturally. You do not just flip coins and come out with English letters or the binary uh, series for pi. On the, on the other hand, uh, using your example and then insisting that there must have been some intelligent intervention in that arrangement because it seems highly improbable it is really another expression of God of the gaps. Well, it's in this particular case, of course, it's not God of the gaps. It's intelligence of the gaps because um, other than that God has certain influence on my mind, um, it was not something that was directly uh, uh, dictated by God himself. So you really, when you see design, you cannot say for sure about the intelligence. Well, you, you can say the minimum requirement for intelligence, and sometimes that becomes God-like, if you like. Uh, we have not been able to create life even having examples in front of us from scratch. The best we've been able to do is to create long, long strings of DNA, take out DNA from some other cell, put ours in, and have the cell reproduce and, and uh, with proteins that we have prescribed. That's the best we've been able to do. Uh, which means that as humanity sits today, whatever created life is not only intelligent, but more intelligent than the sum total of humanity right now. If it's a superhuman intelligence, that I think you can prove. Now, where we go from there, uh, is it a superhuman and benevolent intelligence? Is it the same intelligence that created the universe? That's open for discussion. Of course. And in fact, the interesting thing is that Richard Dawkins is willing to accept that. Yes, but. <laughs> but he says that it has to be a super intelligence that has evolved to the place where it is and uh, f by an evolved procedure. Why, why does he insist on that? Because he knows that if that intelligence requires an, an intelligence to create it, and that intelligence requires a creation to get it, you get back to 13.7 billion years more or less, and you reach a stone wall where the intelligence that started the very first intelligence cannot have its intelligence dependent upon the arrangement of matter. 
And so now you're talking not just a superhuman intelligence, but a super, I guess you'd have to call it supernatural intelligence. And Dawkins doesn't want to go there. Sure, of course. But then again, uh, from what from what you were saying, um, this latter example is an expression of a brain that ar- arose and was shaped by intelligent design. I guess that's what, I, what I'm getting at. Yeah. I think we all understand what yeah. I'm trying to say. Um, uh, Wes, uh, Mike's coming down to you. I would like to observe that this kind of a discussion is itself strictly the result of imposition of rules which cannot be broken. Adventists have their own set of rules which superimposed upon this set of rules would have to introduce such things as the devil and evil which the rules of this kind of discussion absolutely refuses even to acknowledge. But I believe Adventists have to acknowledge that because we have been given here we go violating the rules again, higher knowledge. And in addition to that, we Adventists have to not only acknowledge the existence of supernatural evil, but also of supernatural God, who we Adventists like to think epitomizes love. Love has nothing to do whatsoever with this kind of discussion. Uh, By the way, um, I think that that's true not just for Adventists, but also for most conservative Christians. Go ahead. I think I'm done. Well, are we all talked out? In that case, why don't we quit? Uh, uh, oh, uh, did you have something to say? Let's pass the mic up to Leonard Brand here. One of the thing that has changed through time is that um, <clears throat> as knowledge has increased, we in many cases move past the God of the gaps to the opposite of that. Science more and more and more says there has to be, if we're all willing to admit it, there has to be something more than what nature can do by itself. So that's, just, that's scientific progress in, in the direction that we would expect. Yeah. Uh, even in the case of evolution itself, um, there are a lot of people who recognize now that, that mutations and natural selection simply are not adequate to account for the life that we see. Um, I mean, that's even apart from people who go as far as John Sanford does. That's just people who, uh, you know, are still trying to account for things by a naturalistic process, but they're saying this process won't work. And they don't have anything to replace it yet, but they're recognizing that the process itself won't work. And they're basically doing what uh, Collins called for, you know, uh, that is we don't have a good explanation for this. The explanations we have are just not adequate. We don't have a, 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 we don't have a substitute. We don't want to go there, so we're going to stay with um, an, an atheistic procedure. But we have to admit that we're, the, if I can put it that way, um, intellectually unfulfilled atheists. <laughs> so... Uh, I th- I think that if people are honest, it's a little bit easier to to deal with that those kinds of questions. 
Anyway, come back next week. I guess we will have a uh, video and then uh, some discussion and fascinating video and hopefully fascinating discussion, but we'll see.